good to see you all here. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, Paul O'Cray, the Vice Chancellor of the University, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to uh, this inaugural lecture by uh, Stephen Drinkwater, Professor of Economics, and the title is Migration, Ethnicity and Self-Employment. I'm looking forward very much to that. Let me tell you just a little bit about uh, Stephen's background. He studied economics at uh, Swansea and then went uh, straight on, did a master's in business economics there. He then I embarked on an academic career. He had fellowships at Manchester Metropolitan University and Portsmouth University. And that was followed by a lectureship at the University of Surrey where he also gained a... Somebody trying to break into your lecture. So you, uh, he took a lectureship at the University of Surrey, and when he was there, he also gained a PhD on the basis of published uh, work. And the subject of that uh, PhD was migration and the labour market performance of minorities in the UK. Then in 2009, Stephen returned to Swansea, uh, as a, then he became a reader in the Department of Economics there and its Director of Research. Then, in 2014, I'm delighted to say that Stephen agreed to join us here at Roehampton, uh, becoming Professor in Economics, and he also now is the Research Lead for the Business School here. And in addition to that substantive role here at Roehampton, Stephen's also a Research Fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labour in Bonn, he also uh, holds the same role at the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity at the University of Manchester and at the Centre for Research and the Analysis of Migration at UCL. Stephen has a, a wide range of research interests. He works in particular in the area of labour economics and regional economics with a focus on labour market inequalities and discrimination. He works on issues uh, related to international and interregional migration, and as I think we're going to hear today, also on self-employment and entrepreneurship. All of them extremely topical subjects, I would say. Um, Stephen is an extremely uh, prolific author. There are numerous uh, articles in very highly rated journals. He's on the editorial board of Economic Issues and reviews for a great number of international journals. He's also been uh, admirably successful in attracting external funding for his work and has held significant grants from the Welsh Government, the ESRC, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the European Commission. He's currently co-investigator of a £7 million ESRC project examining civil society in Wales and other parts of the UK. All that tells me that we are extremely fortunate to have uh, Stephen as a colleague, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome him up. Please welcome Professor Stephen Drinkwater. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you for everyone for attending today, uh, particularly those of you who've travelled some distance, but obviously colleagues uh, within the department as well, and also sort of co-authors and collaborators from the past, uh, because as I say, this is my inaugural lecture, but. I wouldn't be here today if had it not been for some colleagues and things who've helped me along the way. And, you know, I will probably try and mention people as I go along, but uh, do forgive me as well if I forget you and things. As I said, there's many people who've been uh, instrumental in helping me in this journey in some ways to, uh, to where I've got to now. So, as Paul said, the title of the talk is Migration, Ethnicity and Self-Employment. So, it's quite wide-ranging, and uh, that in some ways reflects my various research interests, uh, but also it obviously is topical as well. I think it makes a contributions in terms of public debates that are going on at the moment, but also in terms of important policy issues as well, which I'll try and allude to as, as we go along. And also, as I said, you know, I've got quite a lot of wide range of research interests. It's obviously to decide what to do. You know, when you get asked to do a <coughs> inaugural lecture, which bit of it maybe best reflects you or your, your, the work that you've done over the years. And I, I don't normally use photographs in my slides, but I'll make an exception today. My brother's into photography and Derek and others as well. But, you know, what is it that kind of captures the research that I've done? I've done a lot of research on immigration. Obviously, it's a very topical issue. 
So there's plenty of things I could choose from there. Secondly, and related to immigration, is ethnicity, and where we started from in terms of a project I'm going to talk about in a moment. And you'll see there's, an, uh, there's a clear link between migration and ethnicity. I'm in a business school now, haven't always been. So hopefully, you know, choose a topic that is related to the business school and the people hopefully will be interested in. And kind of everything then that comes it, or brings it together is self-employment. And in some ways, this is a useful um, picture here because it says we have, and this is the choice between employment and self-employment. And it's obviously a choice you know, our students hopefully are making in terms of when they go out into the labour market. As Paul was saying, I have done some work on other labour market outcomes, unemployment, labour market participation, and in some ways that will come into the talk a little bit today, but it's really this choice that people have, or sometimes you might think of it as a constraint as well, between these two different types of employment, either working for somebody else, or setting up your own business, or taking on a business, uh, and working for yourself. And in terms of this, uh, this business school idea, people in the business school will be thinking about entrepreneurship. Okay? And there's obviously a link between entrepreneurship and self-employment. Okay? But they're not the same. There are similarities and there are overlaps. But are all people who are self-employed entrepreneurs? Arguably not. Okay, so for example, you know, and as the labour market is changing in terms of regulations, as we see cases coming through all the time in terms of what it means to be self-employed and what employers are doing in terms of the contractual terms, that some people who are termed as self-employed, we might not think of them as being really entrepreneurs. So I would say that you know, self-employment is this broader term. Now, we can think about different types of self-employment, and that might give us you know, an indication or improve the link between self-employment and entrepreneurship. For example, in the US, there's a literature now on incorporated versus unincorporated self-employment. And in Europe and UK, there's these views of, sort of necessity versus opportunity entrepreneurship. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about self-employment in general. However, I think it is important to be aware of these distinctions. There is the relationship there between self-employment and entrepreneurship, but we might be talking about slightly different things sometimes. And where possible, I will allude to the fact of different types of self-employment, but certainly when we go back further, when we look at the data, it becomes increasingly difficult to make those distinctions. And so rather than getting caught, too caught up in saying, this is entrepreneurship, this is self-employment, I'll just generally talk about self-employment and different types of self-employment. Okay, where did this kind of all begin in terms of ethnic or migrant entrepreneurship or self-employment? Well, like many other ideas, it tends to start in the United States, particularly in terms of the types of populations they have there. And in terms of the literatures, it's both from sociology and economics. And some of the early contributions came from sociology. So some of the early theories were, so for example, by Ivan Light in 1972, enclave economies. And this, a term which is still sort of popular now, where you get groups of co-ethnics in certain areas, which will then lead to the establishment of business organisations within those areas to serve those communities, and they are sort of embedded there. A different idea came from Edna Bonacic in 1973, which was the idea of on ethnic entrepreneurs as middle, called middlemen minorities, where these were entrepreneurs essentially who would identify opportunities within markets. And they might be there for relatively short periods of time just to make 
uh, a profit from these. So to serve those markets within, again, particular areas, often urban areas. However, as Paul was saying, I was an economist, so certainly the, uh, the area I came into it was the, sort of the, the economic literature which started to develop, certainly in the United States in the 1980s, in terms of uh, ethnic entrepreneurship. So for example, the idea by Rojas in uh, 1986, which is assimilation into self-employment, the idea that over a period of time, ethnic minorities and migrants would move into self-employment as they became, got more experience, capital uh, and physical and human capital. And also, uh, so this would be Borja Hassan Bronner's in 1989, might be pushed into self-employment through discrimination or the impact that consumer discrimination can have on entrepreneurs. Finally, here we've got uh, the paper by Jungert in 1995, which is saying that what happens as well in terms of uh, ethnic self uh, ethnic uh, minorities or migrants might come from countries which have an established tradition of self-employment, which might make them more likely to be self-employed in the countries that they migrate to. So those were kind of the ideas that were coming through from the US, both in terms of the theory, and also <coughs> they had the data to try and start analysing these issues. In the UK, there was some emergent research taking place in terms of ethnic and migrant entrepreneurship or self-employment, but they were typically associated with relatively small-scale surveys, would look on, say, one group. They wouldn't be doing lots of comparative research. Okay. So, when I started uh, doing some of the research and... This is linked to a project uh, which was funded by the ESRC. Derek uh, Leslie here was the principal investigator on the project. And in some ways it was the, sort of the first project which looked you know, in a comprehensive way of ethnic minorities in the labour market in the UK. So we had access to you know, quite large data sets to see, to see that picture of what's happening in terms of the UK labour market in terms of uh, ethnic minorities the range of different groups. And in terms of the, the data which was becoming available, which enabled us to analyse this topic, then we had the census of the population. Yes, the census has been going a long time, since 1801, but it only started asking a question on ethnicity in 1991. So before that, little was known using the census from about ethnicity. Plus, microdata was available after 1994, which enabled you to look a lot more closely at what's going on in terms of the data. Around about the same time as well, the Labour Force Survey, again, which has been going since 1973 in the UK, became quarterly and became a much larger data set. And also had a range of questions on migration. And the better at the time, certainly, in terms of the census, in terms of the questions on migration. And then we had other specific data sets. So a data set which I've used quite a lot is the Fourth National Survey of Ethnic Minorities, uh, which had quite a large sample size on lots of different ethnic minority groups and also a range of specific ethnic questions. Okay, so much more specific and less general than these data sources. And we used all of these data sources to try, say, try and build up a picture. So, I've also got Phil Murphy and Dave Blackby in the audience as well, who are part of, of the project team, which tried to do this. I should also mention as well, a lot of the work, certainly on self-employment, which I'll go on to in a moment, was done with Ken Clark. So Ken and I did a lot of work uh, on ethnic self-employment. Okay, the other thing you should note as well, especially if you're sort of um, a data geek or something like me, is that things are not always that easy when you do research. So things change over time in terms of definition. So you try and do the best that you can. So um, what I'll try and do in terms of doing the presentation is you may be cutting a couple of corners, but basically try to compare appropriate groups with each other. But also in the UK, we have a problem a little bit with geography as well, in the sense that there are different censuses in different parts of the country. So 
Scotland has their own census, ask their own questions, look at ethnicity questions. I, Northern Ireland has their own as well. So some of the time I'll be talking about the UK, some of the time I'll be talking about England and Wales. So even though in Wales we have our own language, we still have the English census. So you can have, but you can fill it in in either Welsh or English. Okay, that's gives you the job. But we actually ask exactly the same questions. Okay, so we can try and build up the picture. Okay, so what was going on as well in terms of the UK population? And obviously some of this is, is still going on now in terms of migration and the different ethnic composition of the UK population. Well, we've heard of it in the news quite recently, the Windrush generation. And again, 70 years ago this week, the Windrush landed in the UK. So I'll show you in a moment you can still see evidence of that in terms of those populations that came with that initial migration in 1948. Okay, so it's post-war Commonwealth migration started with the Windrush, but then it developed in different ways for different groups of Commonwealth migrants. And what we've seen generally, and we see evidence obviously in the university in terms of our student populations, is an increase in proportion of UK-born or second-generation migrants. Okay, not true of all groups, as I'll show, but generally. And these demographics are going to have implications for self-employment. Okay, so just quick, take you through a quick table here with our main groups in the UK. Okay, certainly 91, white, black Caribbean, black African, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Chinese. And what I've got in this table is the population, okay? what we think is accurate population based on census or LFS data. Obviously, again, in terms of the public, you might think populations of particular sizes, okay? But this is what we think is the accurate data. And also the percentage who are UK born. Okay, so for example, whites in 1991 in England and Wales, about 47 million. In 2017, not grown that much, 49 million, but you can see there the percentage UK born has actually fallen, okay? And I'll talk a picture about that with Mikhail's work later in terms of the different groups of white, other whites who've come to the UK, okay? Because this is, includes white British and other white groups. So the Black Caribbeans, again, who came with the Windrush, okay? Grew from, say, half a million in 91, relatively slowly compared to some groups, 0.6 million in 2017, but it's an increase in proportion of UK born. Okay, so those groups that haven't had so much migration over the years. Black Caribbean is a group which has grown dramatically from 0.2 million to 1.3 million. And the percentage of UK born has stayed pretty similar okay, because of these migration patterns. Similarly with Indians, started at a higher rate, 800,000, but has doubled, okay, but a relatively similar percentage UK born. Pakistanis, again, has grown from you know, less than half a million to 1.24 million, but the percentage of UK born has increased, and so <coughs> has it for the Bangladeshi community as well. Okay. Chinese interesting group, especially for students in the UK, still being relatively small, 150,000, 91, up to about 300,000 in 2017, but again, it's actually fallen. So again, we're seeing, and this is the whole of the population, uh, a relatively small proportion of UK born. How did that translate then into self-employment rates? So this was the, so say, initial picture in 1991, and what I've got in this graph here is the rate, which is the number in self-employment, divided by the total employment multiplied by 100. Okay, so what we have there is the rates for these different groups split into males and females. So you can see from this graph, and this is a typical um, the picture for gender differences in self-employment, that for all the groups, male self-employment is considerably higher than females. Okay, we'll see it obviously 1991. But for some groups, say Chinese, it was relatively high, and particularly for males, but also for females uh, to some extent as well, and for Bangladeshis and, and Indians. For whites, there was a big differential between males and females. And also, the two black groups have very low rates of self-employment, both 
for uh, males and females. Okay, so that was the picture in 1991 when we first had this data which became available. So some groups have high rates of self-employment. Okay? Some groups have big differentials between males and females. Also, we said, types of self-employment are important. So what about, are they in particular types of self-employment? So let's look at Chine Chinese. We said we had this high, high rate. They're overwhelmingly in 91 in this category, distribution, retail, and particularly restaurants. Okay, so over 80% there. Very few in these other types of self-employment, whether they be construction, professional uh, science, or transport. Other groups say Pakistanis, which is high, but again, you can see transport, quite high. Taxi drivers, okay? Indians, again, concentrated in distribution, retail, and restaurants. Whereas some other groups, such as whites and black Caribbeans, are more evenly dispersed. So, for example, quite high proportions of black Caribbeans, okay, small numbers, but in construction. Okay, so we said demographics might explain some of this. When they came to the UK, age, education, family background. But what we tried to do when we got that initial picture is to try and explain well, what specifically is going on. Why are we getting these differences between the groups? So we looked at some ethnic specific effects. Okay, so one which we particularly looked at, given we were labour economists, is discrimination. Discrimination in paid employment. So in other words, were certain groups being pushed into self-employment? Okay, so um, we'd expect those groups who might think they'd do better in self-employment compared to paid employment to choose self-employment. What else? Well, when they arrived in the UK, how long have they been in the UK? So this idea, which was linked to Borjas's paper of assimilation, takes time once you arrive in a country to build up your stock of human and financial capital to set up a business. Cultural factors and religion could have an effect. So when uh, I was doing this work, I was kept on quoting this paper by Rafiq, okay? Little did I know that Mohammed had written this paper, uh, which a, while, a little while ago, about religion and self-employment. So when I first came to Rahamd, and I said to Mohammed, so are you the Rafiq that wrote that paper on religion and self-employment? And he said, yes. So uh, I finally got to meet Rahamid with this paper about how religion can have an influence on, on self-employment. Also, this idea we said before, really down to light initially about this ethnic economies, enclave economies, the protected market that ethnic minorities might locate, or immigrants, within areas where they have this market which is available to them, the specific goods, whether it's food, clothing, or so on. <coughs> However, and this wasn't, I would say you might have been aware in some ways, but what we found certainly in the UK, and we'll show in a moment, is that obviously these, often, these areas are very deprived areas. And so that might have implications for the number of businesses that could be set up. Finally, we have English language ability. And we could think that that could have two effects. If you have low levels of, say, English language skills, that could encourage entry into self-employment because you have less options. Or you might be limited in terms of the opportunities that you can get in terms of self-employment. Okay? You might only be able to do certain uh, types of self-employment jobs. Okay, and. Ken Clark and I tested these kind of ideas in this data set, this fourth national survey of ethnic minorities. So those of you who like regression results, uh, I put in one table for you, okay? Uh, but I won't talk too much about it, okay? But basically what we find, yeah, it's typical, so evidence generally in favor of those theories, okay? So for example, there's a slight difference between whether you include the, the controls for ethnic groups or not, but generally the results were, were fairly similar, that those people who were predicted to do better in self-employment were more likely to move into self-employment. Okay? Interpreted that as evidence they were being pushed out of the labour market, paid labour market, and 
attracted to self-employment. We found evidence against the enclave hypothesis in the UK, which is basically the higher the proportion of people from your own group within your local area, the less likely you were to be self-employed. Okay? Because we were saying that they were deprived of those, but also there was a lot of competition there as well. Okay? Whereas if you moved to another part of the country, you could set up your restaurant or um, business organisation there. Okay? So that was a slightly different result from uh, the, the US data, but we found it in all the data that we looked at. We also found that the most, more recent migrants were less likely to be self-employed, okay, as we might expect, less, le lower levels of physical, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, financial and human capital, and also some evidence that those who had poor English skills were less likely to be self-employed. In terms of religion, this was relative to, to Muslims, we found that some groups, such as Christians, again, were less likely <coughs> to be self-employed. Okay, so that was the, uh, the picture in sort of 1991, early, you know, the early period. But like everything else, nothing stays the same. Things change over time, particularly as we saw this kind of dynamically evolving ethnic and migration population in the UK. So how is that going to change that position with regards to self-employment? And some of this research was done, Paul mentioned it earlier, it was a project which Ken Clark and I did for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation when we were in University of Surrey. And what we found was that the change in demographic characteristics of some groups, such as Chinese and Indians, was changing their self-employment propensities. In particular, increasing in education attainment. So again, Increased opportunities in paid employment meant, let's say, compared to their first generation, their parents, they had lots of opportunities and they were going into high level professions. Okay, so the other thing which we noticed as well is the groups are becoming more diverse. So we had those sort of six or seven groups at the start, we've got an increase in number of groups, partly because of wider migration patterns, so migrants from different parts of the world were increasingly coming to the UK, okay, not just concentrated amongst Commonwealth migrants, and also an increase in mixed groups as well. Okay, so we can have a look at what, how that changes the picture. But we still find high levels of concentration in certain industries. So those people who were Chinese self-employees were typically still working in restaurants, Pakistanis again, typically working in, in taxi industry. And I'll move on to it in a moment. We saw post 2000 EU migration is becoming very important. And again, that's going to change the picture, particularly after the 2004 and 2007 enlargement, which I'll, I'll get on to in a moment. Okay, basically all this graph shows is how can we say the change in self-employment between, say, 91 and 2001, is it due to the change in characteristics of the group, or is it due to something else? So what we found is the Chinese were much less likely to be self-employed, and we could say about just over half of that was because they were becoming better educated and their characteristics were changing. Whereas the remainder, we didn't know. There might be some other factors that we couldn't measure. Whereas the Pakistanis also, we say, becoming better educated, becoming older, and so on, but also other factors might be making them more likely to be self-employed. Okay, so that's not changing their rates very much. Indians, again, becoming better educated, older, but also they're less likely to become self-employed. Okay, so we get different patterns in terms of the changes between these ethnic minority groups some of which can be explained by their sort of different demographic factors. What about, if we look at, say, most recent census data in 2011, these more diverse groups? Okay. And what we find is we have different groups now in the UK, much more diverse ethnic uh, population. 
And so if we look at males to start off with, what we find is the group which is the highest self-employment rate, okay, again, might be different types of self-employment, are white, gypsy, and Irish, uh, Irish travellers. Okay? Whereas some of the other groups which have typically had high self-employment rates, Pakistanis, for example, and Chinese are still have relatively high rates. Whereas some of the other groups, as we said before, are still low in terms of the black Caribbeans, other blacks, black Africans. What about females? Well, again, there's some similarities. So again, the group of females with the highest self-employment rates are white gypsy and Irish travellers. Chinese also have high self-employment rates for females. But again, some other groups which are interesting to note as well in terms of relatively high self-employment rates. So for example, white other white. And this is basically EU migrants, okay, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So relatively high educated female migrants from Europe have relatively high self-employment rates. Okay, so what the sort of more recent research that I've done is in relation to this sort of European migration particularly, which has happened since 2000. And this has been particularly influenced by policies, whether directly or indirectly. Because these policies have affected particularly EU migrants. So, for example, in our ESRC project, which uh, Michal and John Eid were involved with, what we first, sort of first noticed is when we looked at the data is that those Polish migrants who were coming particularly Polish, but also from other um, new member states, in the early 2000s were allowed, or had high rates of self-employment. Why was that? Well, it's down to this 1991 Europe Agreement, where they could enter the UK. So before the UK became open to migrants from Eastern Europe, they could enter the UK as self-employees. Okay, so a lot of them were coming in as self-employees. Okay, so they had high rates of self-employment. And then, after we had high rates of migration from Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, between 2004 and 2007, when the next group were at entrance, so EU A2, Romania and Bulgaria, the government set up transitional arrangements. They said, we're not going to make the labour market open. Essentially, you can only come in if you're self-employed. Again, okay, so that's having some influence on how these differences exist between these different groups uh, in the labour market. Probably a more indirect effect, but maybe the government might claim all, uh, differently, is that in the sort of post sort of Great Recession, sort of 2009 to 2011, we saw lots of migration from other parts of Europe because of the Eurozone crisis. The UK was doing relatively well. Okay? Some of them obviously came to the city, but also some uh, migrants from Eurozone crisis countries also set up businesses in the UK. This I've mentioned mostly policies and issues in relation to EU migrants. However, there are important policies and changes for non-EU migrants as well. So for example, the points-based system, which we're also familiar with in universities, as well, which was introduced in 2008, which was restricting migration from outside the EU. And it had certainly had an effect as well on self-employment. Okay, so how did this you know, show itself in terms of the figures? Well, what we can see here in terms of these two lines is non-EU migration in the blue line and in the orange line EU migration from the EU. And you can see they're both going upwards, okay? which we know in terms of general uh, issues in terms of the population. Okay? And these are uh, migrant workers, okay? so those who are in employment wouldn't look just a bit higher in terms of all workers, because a high proportion of migrants, particularly EU migrants, who in the population are in employment because they are of, of working age. Okay, so we're seeing them increasing these, both these, uh, these trends. However, if we look 
at different groups, we see a more sort of distinct picture. So, for example, again, this orange line shows EU aid migrants. So those migrants who came to the UK from the eight Central Eastern European countries after 2004. Okay, so particularly Poland, we see this sharp increase okay, after 2004. So it's over now a million migrants in employment from these countries. EU 14 okay, stayed fairly stable up until about 2011. And then as we saw the Eurozone crisis, those have started to increase as well. And the line in grey, which is EU 2 which is Romania and Bulgaria. Okay, it's fairly small until 2007 and then an increase here. Okay, so we can see some evidence of those policies in terms of numbers, but what about self-employment? Well, if we look at the groups, we see the UK born as our comparator group, that say non-EU migrants still have higher rates of self-employment. Okay, about 17% compared to 14% this is in 2014 15 where some groups, particularly AEA, EU A2, which is Romanians and Bulgarians, had relative, had very high rates of self-employment, okay, 30%. But that's, as I say, because they were coming into the countries not long after the end of the transition period as self-employees. Okay, and I'll show you in a moment in the sectors which they came in. Uh, EU A8, so even though Polish and other migrants had high self-employment rates immediately after accession, they increasingly became paid employees. Okay, so they're pretty similar rates to the UK born, and the same for migrants from other EU countries. Another sort of area you might be thinking of interested in terms of entrepreneurship, do they create jobs? Okay, so what we find here is the percentage employing others. And well, we can look at there. So for the, the migrants from uh, enlargement countries, so A8 or A2, they generally worked on themselves. They didn't employ anyone else. And again, this is related to the, the types of industries that they work in. Whereas non-EU migrants have the highest rate of employing others. Other EU migrants had high rates of part-time employment. And again, that was what we were saying earlier in terms of females. Okay, so in relative terms, other EU, eight, uh, other EU migrants were increasingly becoming, uh, who were self-employed were increasingly females. Okay, and that's uh, and where's its lowest for the UA2. So what types of jobs, or self-employed jobs, were these migrants doing? What we found is that they're mainly, certainly for the A2, so Romanians and Bulgarians, were coming into the construction industry. Okay? And if we look at London, okay, we can see evidence every day, okay, those of us who live in London. Okay, this is back in 2014-15, over half of EA2 um, construction, uh, sorry, uh, self-employed workers in London, in this group, were in the construction industry. Okay. And EUA8, which is, say, mainly Polish, almost a half in London. Okay. Whereas the other groups, as we said, are typically more sort of spread across the range of industries. Okay, so we can look at the UK born, and also the non-EU in some ways, but again, non-EU, which is all these groups of so Chinese, Pakistanis, okay, who have migrated rather than born in the UK, Indians, are still concentrated in, say, restaurants, retail, and transport, okay, but it's less so than it was in the past. What I should mention as well is since this data, or this paper was published, it's in a, in a book chapter, um, it has changed a bit where these rates are coming down for, for example, the EA2 because they're becoming increasingly more likely to go into paid employment. Okay, so I've, I think I've done my, about my 40 minutes, but I'll just sort of wrap it up with some, some conclusions, but also what we think we might have contributed to this area. Okay, so first of all, I think we've identified there's a large degree of variations in self-employment across ethnic and migrant groups okay, in the UK. And also some change in patterns over time. Okay. There are still some similarities and consistencies over time, but things have changed, particularly as we've seen new types of migration from different parts of the world. Okay, so there's high rates for some migrants and new groups, okay, such as the EU A2, but also, as we said, say 
female migrants from other parts of Europe as well. Whereas we still have high rates of self-employment amongst mostly established groups such as Pakistanis. But lower rates, but maybe the, the gap is narrowing, particularly for females from certain countries, so other EU migrants. We said the policy has become increasingly important. Okay, and these are policies, migration policies, generally, rather than policies targeting self-employment. Particularly from uh, migrants from those countries which joined the EU either in 2004 or 2007. And you can't get away with a talk without mentioning Brexit. Okay, I'm sure it'd be struck off. Okay, there are Brexit-related implications, particularly for certain in areas and certain industries. So, construction in London. Okay? So, it could be many sectors in terms of the labour market in general, but if we're thinking about self-employment, then that could have implications and obviously on other economic considerations. And we just said, talked about self-employment in general, but we should also think about the quality of the job as well as the quantity, in the sense that as the labour market changes, as all the time, and how we define our jobs, we should be thinking about, is it a good quality job in terms of, both in terms of you know, well-being of the individual while they're in work, but also in terms of issues in relation to poverty and in terms of um, sustainability of different labour market areas. Okay, thank you. That's me. So I'm done. Okay. Stephen, thank you very much indeed for that absolutely uh, fascinating picture of uh, what's going on in the world of work and, and migration and self-employment. Um, and I thought it gave us a, a remarkable uh, uh, picture of what, what is going on. Uh, and this obviously work which is extremely timely and important given the, the, the issues you raise around Brexit and all of those other things. And uh, I was sat here thinking, you know, the, as somebody whose subject is... English literature, you know, the power, the sheer power of data and evidence to convince is 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 overwhelming. But of course, that that power is only released when it's in the hands of very expert, uh, a very expert knowledge. And I thought Stephen gave us that expert interpretation in such a clear and and easy way that we all. I, I didn't get the coefficient bits, but <laughs> everything else I think I followed. Uh, uh, but I thought it was really good. Um, and uh, I, I feel I learned an awful lot about the world we are in. Thank you very much, Stephen. Now, those of you who have been to these uh, before know that uh, we don't take questions, but we invite a distinguished colleague from another university to respond on our behalf. And I'm delighted we've got Professor David Blackaby from Swansea University with us. And David, where are you? The office sitting there. David is going to reply now. <clears throat> Well, VC, it's a great honour and privilege to be invited to respond to this inaugural lecture by Stephen and comment on his career and contribution more generally. I was going to shred my notes because I think you've done a lot of what I've done already. But uh, I first met Stephen when he undertook his undergraduate and master's degree in Swansea, which was followed by a brief spell as an RA in Swansea. He then moved to Manchester Metropolitan University to work as a research fellow, on, as Stephen has mentioned, on an ESRC-funded project led by Professor Derek Leslie, who was in the audience, on the labour market experience of ethnic minorities. And clearly that's had a major impact on his career. It was on that project, as Stephen has mentioned, that he first met and worked with Ken Clark, and they went on to form a very productive academic partnership. He then moved to Portsmouth uh, before taking a lectureship at Surrey, where he stayed for 10 years. He then moved back to Swansea in 2019 as a senior lectureship, lecturer on an ESRC-funded research project, an interdisciplinary research project, where he stayed for five years before taking up the chair in Roehampton. Now, Stephen has distinguished himself as an authority in a number of areas, but as we've seen today, particularly in the areas of ethnicity and migration, 
and especially self-employment and EU migration. As we've seen, his research is always topical, with a strong policy focus, is always well informed by an existing literature, and that's not just an economics literature, it's usually a much wider literature, as we've seen today, clearly interdisciplinary, with a clear and informative writing style. And that's all those characteristics he's shown today in this lecture. Now, his research he's taken us through today has been highly significant, which has re been reflected in the very high levels of citations in his research so far. Now, people are concerned about citation data and it can be misused, but if you look at some of his papers pushed out or pulled in, Self-Employment Among Ethnic Minorities in England and Wales, published in Labour Economics, 450 citations. And for an economist, that's a large number. Polls Apart, clever title, uh, 448 citations. Class and Ethnicity, Polish Migrants in London, 300. And finally, Ethnicity and Self-Employment in Britain, published in the Oxford Bulletin of Economics and Statistics, just under 250. And his work has well over 3,000 citations, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's an H-index of something like 26, which is, again, extremely high. But it's not just his academic papers that we would note the importance of his research, that's one measure, but also Stephen's work is having impact. And in the case of Swansea, he was, when he was with us, he was author of one of our four impact case studies, and universities do get feedback from REF panels, and it was given the highest rating of four star, world leading. Now, his research has been driven by the, the, the real importance that his work should have impact, and it's not surprising, therefore, that he's written reports for many government departments, one of which, as it was called then, was, if you can remember it, was the Department for Education and Employment, uh, a Im particularly important report there, benchmarking dis disability. He then went on to write a number of reports for the Welsh Government, as well as other bodies with a strong policy focus, such as the Equality and Human Rights Commission, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and even in Wales earlier on for the Welsh Development Agency, which no longer exists. But not only that, reports for local authorities, both in England and Wales. His research, as the VC has mentioned, has also been supported by a large number of grants uh, from the ESRC and from the EU. And the, his research has been recognised by the fact that he's been invited to sit on advisory boards, such as some from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and he's been given distinguished fellowships, again, as the VC has noted, at UCL, for example, the Centre for Research and Analysis of Migration, and again, the influential Institute of Labour, Study of Labour, IZA, as we know it, in Bonn. VC, I could go on, but it doesn't tell you half the story about Stephen. He was a fantastic colleague, an inspirational lecturer, and an extremely effective administrator who could be always relied upon to get things done, including putting in an enormous amount of discretionary effort on any task he was given, as well as being an extremely nice individual. I was desperately disappointed to see Stephen leave Swansea and have constantly tried to get him to return. However, I know he has and will continue to be an extremely important asset in your institution. Thank you.